And is this your first on camera interview? I think so, yes. What would you like the world to know about you? Oh my goodness. Um, I would like the, the world to know that even if I appear as if I don't have struggles, that um, some things are definitely more challenging for me. Yeah. Um, and that I, I have I have a pretty successful life. I have a really great career and a really wonderful family. And in some ways, I've had to work really hard for that, um, and maybe harder than um, neurotypical folks would work. Um, things I, are harder. I hear sometimes. that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What What was your first ever job? My very first ever job, um, I worked in a factory. Um, I built air compressors. <laughs> and um, I, I did that while I was going to school for college. Nice. And where'd you go to, go to college? Um, I went a couple different places. I ended up graduating with my bachelor's degree from Missouri State University. And I got my master's degree at University of Missouri St. Louis. Awesome. Very impressive, too. Yeah. And and just for our viewers at home, what, what are you currently doing today? I am a licensed clinical social worker. I'm licensed where I live in Missouri. Um, I provide um, therapy in the school setting. So I work with area schools and I do therapy for children. I love that. Uh, K through 12 or anything, uh, any age group specifically? Pretty much all ages, like pre-K through 12. Yeah. Nice. Very cool. And how long have you been doing that? Um, I've been a therapist for about three years now, and I've been in the school setting for about a year. Got it. When were you diagnosed? And uh, you're, you don't have to answer, but how old are you currently today? Yeah, so I'm 33. I'm um, not quite 34 yet. Um, I'll be 34 in January. I was diagnosed when I was about two and a half years old with autism. Um, I did, um, a screening just because my family noticed that I was behind developmentally in a couple areas. I wasn't really talking. Um, sometimes I acted as if I couldn't hear other people. Um, so at first they thought that I was possibly deaf, but I would respond to external stimuli. So they knew that wasn't the case. Um, so I, my mom took me for a screening with this local agency where I grew up and they determined that I had, um, autism. I scored, um, like a 36 on the cars, which I don't even know if they use that anymore. Um, but I don't think they do. I don't think they do. <laughs> so that was considered like mild to moderate autism. So, um, when I learned how to speak and read around the same age, when three years old. Nice. What, yeah. So what, were you, what, what, you were nonverbal? I was mostly nonverbal. Like Got there it. were okay. a handful of words that I would say, but they, they were really random. They, you know, I wasn't really, it yeah. wasn't really like a, a coherent sentence or method of communication. Got it. Got it. What would you say were some of the early obstacles with your diagnosis? And obviously with autism, it's a very wide spectrum. What would you say have been some of your strengths with your diagnosis? Absolutely. Um, so some challenges I had early on were definitely social skills. I really struggled in making friends, understanding people. Um, I was very gullible. And so I was kind of manipulated a lot as a kid, maybe teased or, um, bullied. um, yeah, bullied definitely. And like, I didn't always understand that I was being bullied or that people were being mean to me. Um, so just understanding others, um, communicating, um, effectively, definitely like my comprehension of some things were really difficult. Um, I really struggled in the classroom with understanding certain instructions, like if they weren't given in a clear and like written down way, if they were verbally given to me, I it would just totally fly over my head. Total 180, yeah. Yeah, no. yeah, like it was really hard as a child to understand things. Um, and, but, but honestly, some of my strengths in terms of having autism is um, academically, um, after I did figure out how to do, you know, understand instructions, I did really well academically. 
Um, again, like I said, I started reading when I was three. Um, I could write by the time, you know, before I even got to kindergarten. So in some ways it was a real advantage. The way I processed information um, made reading come so naturally. I don't even remember a time in my life when I couldn't read. I don't, I don't really know what that would be like. I just always remember reading. Um, it's awesome. Yeah. And honestly, I, I really strongly feel that having autism has made me a better clinician, made me a better social worker and a better therapist. Um, I've heard people say before that people with autism don't experience empathy. Uh, oh. that is who, who said that? I'm curious. No, <laughs> it's like an everyday affair on my Facebook page. Yeah, it is a total misconception. It is so untrue. In fact, I feel sometimes I'm, I may experience um, more than typical empathy. I, I've, you know, my feelers are really in tune to other people. And I, I think having autism has really taught me um, how to communicate effectively. Like I had to intentionally seek out how to communicate with other people, how to meet them where they are, because people don't always meet me where I am. Yeah. So, um, so I had to learn how to communicate with others. Um, I think my own experiences, like as a child growing up with some challenges, it's, it's definitely made me more empathetic or compassionate to people who experience their own challenges. Um, Which is great. I, I, yeah, I really do honestly think it has helped me connect with my clients and, and understand in some ways what they're going through. Um, and, and be more effective in yeah. helping others. By, by having that first person perspective, I, I, I love the disability quote, uh, nothing about us without us. And I feel like if, if you're really trying to embrace inclusion from like the core of what inclusion really stands for, it's really getting everyone's voices to the table to have all mm -hmm. the perspectives to help our loved ones. Uh, what would you say has been one of your greatest accomplishments up to this point in your life? Honestly, I, school was hard. Like college was really hard for me. It was a level of like independent functioning that um, was really hard for me. When I like graduated high school, turned 18, entered the adult world, um, it was really hard to navigate. Um, and school was challenging. Um, there's less structure in, in college. You have to really structure it yourself rather than um, you know, a classroom or a parent structuring for you. I didn't access um, special services when I was in college, which I now regret. Um, I think it would have made it easier. So it took me longer to finish my bachelor's degree. It took seven years instead of four because I struggled a lot. Um, I, I really, honestly, my biggest accomplishment is, is finishing school and I'm building my career as a clinical social worker. Um, when I was diagnosed with autism, my mother was told that I would never speak. I would never finish high school. I would always require um, intensive care. Um, I would I would never be a functioning member of society. And my mom was like, and look that. at you now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she was like, I'm not going to let that happen. Um, I think mostly because she just didn't want to take care of me for the rest of her life. <laughs> she really wanted, you know, like, leave the nest. <laughs> so um, there were a lot of people that said, like, I couldn't do it. And, and sometimes I heard that from certain teachers. I had a lot of really supportive teachers and then some teachers that didn't understand. Yeah. Um, so uh, just being able to, to show people, like, I, I accomplished way more than was ever expected of me by professionals. Yeah. Um, way Likewise. more. <laughs> like, as you mentioned, like there needs to be more people at the table. There needs to be a lot more representation. So I would, I, if I were president, I would seek out um, voices of people who are disabled or neurodivergent um, yeah. to, to advise me and to, you know, guide, you know, what we do for people in this country. It, it, it's so interesting you said that because I, I talk to so many local politicians here in New Jersey 
And one of the biggest statistics that just really keeps me up at night sometimes is that individuals with disabilities make up the largest minority in the United States. And when it comes to politics, I was thinking about this last night because there is a woman who is openly autistic, openly LGBT community, and she just won a House of Representatives seat. Uh, and it was just so amazing because I've never heard of anyone who was going to be part of the house who was openly autistic. Yeah. Uh, but it's it, it's like you said, there isn't enough representation overall. It's like these stories that you hear in passing, uh, like the person you mentioned. And I feel like we we definitely need to do more, especially from a grassroots perspective. So I'm really appreciative that you mentioned that. I had a 504 plan. I didn't qualify for an IEP. Um, I had a 504 plan from the time I was, I think, in kindergarten until ninth grade. Um, and she advocated so hard um if a teacher had a problem and you know if i wasn't doing well in the classroom she'd set up a meeting with the school counselor and the teacher and me and we would like hatch it out like she um really advocated for me and i, I just really think the biggest thing in my life and in my success is having a parent who supported me and advocated for me even if she didn't always understand me and she tried. She really tried to understand me. I have, like, my mom gave me a file folder of, like, all my, like, 504 plans and, yeah. you know, assessments and things like that. And, like, there's things in here that she printed off from the internet of just, like, trying to learn about autism, trying to learn about, you know, like, she was reading about, like, Temple Grandin and, like, you know, all kinds of stuff to just try to just try to understand the experiences that I was having and what could she do to help me be more successful. Have you and met Temple? I haven't. I would love to. I, yeah, she's amazing. An incredible advocate. Uh, her mom is actually lives in New York, so she's nearby me. Uh, I met her five years ago, five, six years ago in Memphis University. We were keynoting a conference together. And she's just a wealth of knowledge. I mean, let me tell you, it's like we didn't even want to talk the entire night because it's like she had all these stories of like, I just went to Switzerland to give a talk about uh, ROI benefits of hiring people with disabilities. And I'm like, wow, it's yeah. like, that is one thing you should not say to someone who has autism. I know there are a bunch. <laughs> there are a lot. <laughs> But from um, your perspective. So as a person with, I don't even know the, a better term for it. This is just with high, quote, high functioning autism. As a person who functions um, almost more like a neurotypical person, my, my experience as an autistic person has been invalidated my whole life. You don't have autism. There's nothing wrong with you. Um, or what's wrong with you? <laughs> um, because I am able to function typically because I am able to mask a lot of like the sort of overt symptoms of autism. People don't necessarily see it in me. Um, and they just assume that like, you know, there's not anything going on with her. She doesn't need accommodation or help. Um, you know, I've had people tell me that I was just, I said I had autism for it, you know, to seek attention. Um, and that's really invalidating. Um, and, and also like, there's a lot of stigma that goes with being neurodivergent. Um, I've always had concerns. It wasn't until recently that I really felt comfortable telling people that I had autism. I used to hide it a lot. Um, Invisible but, disability, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah. And that's a big part of why I didn't seek support services in college, because I didn't want people to know, because I was afraid that um, people would limit me or maybe I would miss out on opportunities for employment because they, people, maybe people would assume because she has autism, she can't be a therapist. Oh, she has autism, she'll never be a good social worker because she doesn't have empathy and she doesn't know how to talk to people. I mean, like, I was terrified that um i would lose out on opportunities of success because uh, people knew i had autism so i hid it for a really long time which of course just leads to more masking of symptoms and um 
you know, the, it's exhausting. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it is. It is. Well, so many people, uh, again, the masking concept, so many suffer from burnout because of consistent masking, whether it's mm -hmm. sensory challenges, whether it's stimming and kind of just telling their brain like, all right, I don't want to feel judged. I don't want people to think of me in a certain way. And then I, I do that. And then by the end of the day, it's like complete and utter burnout. I see that so much from a, a wide range of people in our community, but especially school age children, uh, mm -hmm. middle school, high school, especially when I go give talks in the schools. Um, is there anything else you would like for people at home to know about your story? Um, I don't want people to ever give up because they have a diagnosis or someone tells them that they can't do something because they're autistic or because they have, you know, a certain condition or a certain disability. I don't want people to feel like they can give up. One of the reasons that I decided I wanted to talk more about having autism and like come out, so to speak, um, is because I want people to know that they can do it. Like I want people with autism to know like, Hey, I did it. I, I worked really hard. It was extremely challenging. There were times I wanted to give up, but I earned my bachelor's degree. I earned my master's degree. I earned my clinical license. And now I'm, I'm doing it. I'm providing therapy, um, to many children. And I truly believe that having autism has made me more effective as a practitioner and, and just more compassionate as a human. And so like, don't, don't give up, like, don't let other people limit you. If you want to do it, go for it. Um, I had, when I was growing up, I had a U.S. representative named Ike Skelton. I think I mentioned this in my bio and, um, a quote that he gave before his retirement was the, never the skeleton, skeleton quote. Yeah. Yeah. Never be limited by the expectations of others. Never give up, never stop working. And like, that is my life quote. I, I probably want to have that on like my epitaph or something because it, it, it has seriously guided me. Um, I, I don't want, ever want people to give up. And I want people to see like, if someone like myself could do it, who was told from a very young age that I couldn't because I had autism, anybody like really anybody can, can achieve so much. Yeah. Hey everyone, Gary Magro here from A Special Community. I can't thank you enough for watching this video. And if you like this video, please click on some of more videos around our YouTube page. We are just trying to give a voice to countless people in our neurodiverse community. So please, if you can, subscribe to our video page. And then you'll also get to see a little bit more about my story from nonverbal autism to today being a professional speaker. Thanks so much, y'all.